So Mythic Plus is about to be released in a few hours and I wanted to make the, I guess, introductory video for my all healer project. What I'm gonna be doing is playing all of the healing specs in Mythic Plus each week and every, I think every week, I'm going to be releasing a video where I talk about how each healer is feeling as I progress into higher and higher keys as I get a better feel for them, how the meta evolves, things like that. So this is gonna be the first video in, I guess, that series. This is covering week one and two of Dragonflight launch, which is, for me, has been mostly leveling. I have just got my last, my sixth character to level 70, which means I have all healers at 70. I've played five of the seven in Mythic Zeros over the last couple of weeks, with Resto Druid and Holy Paladin being the ones that I have most recently leveled. So at the moment, I have the least feedback for those two specs in particular. Now, Mythic Zeros, uh, for Dragonflight, at least seem very undertuned compared to what they have been in the past. So most of my feedback for healers thus far is less to do with their throughput or healing toolkit and more to do with like quality of life issues, maybe some mana issues, uh, how well they deal damage and things like that. And uh, next week when I get into Mythic Plus, I'm assuming my discussions going forward will be more based on the healing toolkit of each healer and how they perform in the most difficult kind of boss fights or, or trash packs of this season. I'd like to quickly go over something I've made a few forum posts about in the past couple of weeks and have made a video a few weeks ago as well about this. And that is that I believe the healing meta this season is going to be based on or focused around AOE healing throughput more than any other factor. And that is to say, I believe the limiting factor for the highest keys and how far people can push for this season is going to be the ability of the healer in the group to heal through certain unavoidable damage mechanics. And I'll be interested to be able to, uh, I guess, come back to this video at the end of the season and see how right or, or wrong I was in that prediction. But to get started, the second character I leveled was my monk to play Mistweaver. And I've done a bunch of Mythic Zeros in both weeks, and I've already started having, I guess, some quality of life issues with Mistweaver. That is primarily for the fist weaving build that uses Feyline Stomp, and the quality of life issue I'm referring to is the cooldown, and I guess the, uh, the thin line and positional requirement of you being on that line. Now, I know you can use Chi Burst and Rising Mist to kind of pseudo force a reset on the Feyline Stomp cooldown because each healing or damaging event of Chi Burst and healing event of Rising Mist as an independent chance to proc the reset of Feyline Stomp. But even with that, I have noticed a lot in the past two weeks that I always want to move more than my Feyline Stomp graphic on the ground allows. Uh, sometimes that's because the tank's moving around or the mobs themselves are moving around or there are things on the ground that I have to avoid and adjust my positioning for. And I often just don't have the cooldown up to replace my Feyline Stomp, which is probably the major issue I have at the moment with the Fist Weaving build. I also have been having some issues with the smart healing, the quote unquote smart healing of Ancient Teachings. Now Ancient Teachings is a smart heal in that it will always prioritize injured targets, but it isn't smart in that those injured targets are prioritized for their missing health. So if there's someone on 10% health and someone on 90% health, the ancient teaching healing will always prioritize those injured targets, but there are often times when my ancient teachings healing heals the people who aren't in danger, who are at high health but injured and doesn't heal the people who are in more danger at lower health. This isn't as big of an issue for me as the Feyline Stomp cooldown, but it is something I've started to notice. Uh, mostly when I get a nice big uh, Rising Sun Kit crit, and I notice that it goes to healing the person who is missing the smallest sliver of health, such that it feels like my Rising Sun Kick didn't do any healing at all through Ancient Teachings, because it just it heals the wrong person. The main issue I have with this is that it, it, it kind of forces me to stop fist weaving and then either trade a cooldown or stand still and like turret heal someone up. Fist weaving damage has been pretty strong for me. It feels really good on packs, uh, especially packs in Mythic Zeros that die quite quickly. Kind of situation where 
your group runs into a pack, you drop your Feline Stomp, you spam your Spinning Crane Kick, or you do a couple of Tiger's Palm into Blackout Kicks. And before you know it, the pack's already dead. Uh, I imagine that as we get into Mythic Plus, like properly with Thundering and more melee mechanics and packs that live longer, that this is going to feel, I guess, slightly worse because I won't always want to be in melee range or I won't always be able to hit the target I want to prioritize damage into because there are quite a few mobs that move around or charge around or have anti-melee mechanics. Um, and I'll be pressing Bayline Stomp, I guess, more often to make up for movement. On the whole though, Fist Weaving as a package feels very good on packs of enemies, but quite weak on bosses. I've also found that I mean, Shi-G, every time I look at this on paper and I, I kind of like do the napkin maths to see how much healing I should be doing and how powerful Shi-G should be, it always looks like Shi-G should be a really, really good cooldown, but then when I go to use it in practice, it never quite feels like it should. I'll be interested to see if this changes or how it changes going forward, moving up into higher keys. Uh, I've also been playing around with a Tear of Morning build that focuses on enveloping mist more than anything for the lion's share of its healing. When I was doing my Mythic Zeros, the Zen Pulse bug hadn't been fixed. That only came through, I think, earlier this week. So I'll be interested to go back into keys uh, next week and see what kind of damage I can do on a casting build just with Zen Pulse. But from my Mythic Zeros, like I said, with the bug in place, my damage was effectively non-existent. However, my healing toolkit felt excellent. The Tear of Morning build that focuses on enveloping mist for its healing has an excellent healing toolkit. It, it can have some mana issues I've found, but not much more than a few other healers. It kind of, the the fact that you can lean into Clouded Focus and Life Cycles or Mana T, and then lean into Yulong for the extra mana reduction when you, re when you need a cooldown and you really need to pump a lot of healing. The ability to combine all those three things together uh, means, yeah, your, your mana issues as a Enveloping Mist spamming Mistweaver is much better than you think it would be in that scenario. Uh, for years, Mistweavers have always known that you press Enveloping Mist, you go very quickly. But with the tier build now, yeah, you can you can actually heal pretty well, uh, press Enveloping Mist often, and for the most part, not have to worry about mana at all, which has been quite nice. I think it could still be an issue on tyrannical bosses, but we'll see. The major issue I have with the Tier of Morning enveloping build is, like I said, the fact that it just doesn't do any damage, which feels pretty bad. Also, not being in melee range for stun and kick doesn't feel great. I also tried out a mastery build. In my most recent video, I talked about a possible mastery stacking build for Mistweaver. I spent a couple of days farming zeros and rares and things like that to build up a mastery set. I ended up walking around with 3700 mastery at about 365 item level, uh, which is mastery on every single piece of gear. About as much mastery as you can get at the moment. And maybe I'm playing it wrong, but it felt horrible. Uh, I've said it before, I'll say it again, even if Mastery was so strong that you could always guarantee that any target you hit with Gusts of Mists goes to full health. Which with a high Mastery build, especially with Essence Font buffs out, you can basically do that right now. And even with that, it still feels bad. Because no matter what you do in a Mastery heavy build, you can only ever really move health bars on one target at a time. And there are just too many mechanics in dungeons at the moment that require group-wide throughput healing. I will revisit a mastery build. I'll also try maybe less mastery but still having some. I'll try no mastery build for fist weaving and things like that going forward. But at the moment my my kind of overall take on Mistweaver for right now the first couple of weeks of Dragonflight is that I feel like I can't quite get a good build going. I either play a fist weaving build that has some quality of life issues and has some kind of boss healing issues or I play a tier of morning enveloping build that does no damage. That's that's effectively where I'm at at the moment. Very interested to see Mistweaver is kind of the X factor for me at the moment. It's the healer I'm expecting the biggest changes with over time as I get different gear setups, different talent setups, different build setups. I'm sure people in the comments will tell me everything I'm doing wrong or things I could try to do better. So I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing how Mistweaver plays out. 
Next up for me is going to be Resto Shaman. Now Resto Shaman is the healer I level third, I believe. And this is the this has been the big surprise for me in the first couple of weeks. The recent buffs to Acid Rain, the I think they were 40% buffs to pretty much all of Resto Shaman's damage abilities, like Chain Lightning. And then the further buff on top of that, I think for another 40% to Lava Burst and things. Resto Shaman slaps right now. It is, in my opinion, the sleeper healer at the moment. Resto Shaman to me right now is a healer that has a fantastic healing toolkit that also does good damage, like like good damage. Acid Rain isn't crazy strong, but it's just, it's a solid, you know, 20, 30% of my damage done in dungeons at the moment. Lava Burst with its buffs basically ensures that your single target damage is always quite good, especially if you're stacking haste and a bit of verse instead of heavy crit stacking. Uh, but like I said, Resto Shaman's really kind of been the glow up healer for me for the past couple of weeks. Riptide feels very strong still. Uh, if anything, Riptide used to do a lot of heavy lifting with its initial upfront heal. And now with the 40-40 change, it now feels like Riptide, uh, Resto Shaman gets a lot of value out of the Riptide upfront heal and the hot component as well. Chain heal also feels really quite good. The Tidal Waves buffs to include chain heal in the cast time reduction for Tidal Waves is excellent. Resto Shaman right now is also the kind of healer where there's a there's a quite a bit of depth to the spec because if you want to, you can add quite a few modifiers to any spell you pretty much want to the point where if you really are in a situation where you need an enormous uh, spot heal or you want to do some heavy single target healing or some heavy AOE healing you have the buttons to do those things. Being able to press things like flame shock to buff your next heal or unleash life or to combine those things together you can get, I mean, at the moment, most people in Mythic Zeros have like 200-ish K health. You can get 200 K healing surges right now. You can literally 100% heal people with just a healing surge right now. So yeah, Resto Shaman, very, very strong to me. A big part of what makes Resto Shaman's toolkit, healing toolkit, very strong in my eyes right now is Ascendance. Ascendance is a incredible cooldown. It's a button you can now press that just doubles your healing like straight up. And that has meant that there have been situations where if I was playing a few other healers, I just don't think I would be able to heal through a couple of mistakes or things going wrong in Mythic Zeros. But Ascendance allows you to do 40, 50k HPS when you have to. Healing Stream Totem also does some very heavy lifting right now. Once my Shaman got a bit of gear with a somewhat half decent group, even in week one, the Mythic Zeros, my Resto Shaman could heal all the dungeons with basically nothing but Riptide and Healing Stream Totem. It's that strong. I imagine as well, as gear gets better and better and Resto Shamans can start stacking quite a lot of haste, Healing Stream Totem is going to do some pretty crazy things. Right now, if you take the Totem Reset talent on the class tree, you can actually get four Healing Stream Totems active at the same time if you want to. And there have been sometimes uh, in dungeons <laughs> before I kind of started working around this tech where I would trade cooldowns for certain mechanics and it got to the point where I would just get lazy on my Resto Shaman and I knew some kind of heavy AOE healing mechanic was coming up and I would just drop four healing stream totems and do damage. And they, they did all the heavy lifting required. Really, really fun right now. I went into Dragonflight thinking the 4040 changes would require quite a lot of changes for Resto Shaman, but I actually think it's probably one of the healers that has been impacted the least by the 4040 changes. And that is because, like I said, Riptide, the hot now does a lot of heavy lifting. Your healing stream totem can also do a lot of heavy lifting. Your chain heal can also feel quite juicy, or if you need it to be, you can buff it up significantly. Same thing with your healing surges for spot healing or tank healing. It really feels like it's got the whole package right now, except for an external. The one X factor I have for Resto Shaman right now is as we get into higher and higher keys, I am wondering how much of a, a weakness it's going to be or how much of a handicap I'm going to feel like I have by not having a proper external cool. I feel like Ascendance, uh, Spirit Link if I want it, and even uh, NS covers pretty much all of my kind of group healing requirements. So yeah, the only thing I'm worried about is maybe not having an external could hurt 
as I get into higher keys. We'll see how that plays out. The mana longevity of Resto Shaman is probably the best of any healer at the moment. Maybe Preservation is in a similar boat where it just doesn't spend mana. Uh, you can play Resto Shaman right now, like I said, with a lot of just Riptides and Healing Stream Totems, with a few Healing Surges or Healing Waves, or even a couple of uh, Chain Heals thrown in every now and then, and your mana bar effectively won't move. The only way I've been able to even spend mana on Resto Shaman is by basically playing a heavy Chain Heal build and using Chain Heal <laughs> to heal through every single damage pattern. Tank healing, chain heal. Spot healing, chain heal. Self healing, chain heal, right? That's the only way you can really spend mana right now as a Resto Shaman. I would also say that the kind of the damage toolkit of Resto Shaman right now is, in my eyes, the it's equal with Discipline Priest, and that is equal best. Uh, like I said, this is still obviously very preliminary, kind of early, even pre-season thoughts, but if, if this coming Mythic Plus season ends up anything like the last couple of seasons where healers get to a point where they really just do damage for 80% of a dungeon. The only two healers I can think of that would be really enjoyable enough to play to make a heavy kind of damage playstyle enjoyable as a healer would be Discipline Priest and Resto Shaman. Having Stormkeeper, having AG, having your like normal lava burst procs that you can just lob meatballs at people feels great. Uh, same with just even if you want to play it very simply and just spam Chain Lightning on every pack for damage, you do a lot of damage as Resto Shaman. If you want to, you can also spec into Acid Rain, which has been, like I said, an extra kind of staple or like a, an extra part of the foundation of Resto Shaman damage. It hasn't overtaken the rest of the toolkit. It's just an extra thing now that contributes a decent amount of damage over the course of a dungeon. So to, I guess, wrap all that up again, overall Resto Shaman I'm very happy with. I could consider, I am considering maining Resto Shaman for, for dungeons for this coming season, just because it's damage kit feels great. It's healing kit feels great. Its mobility feels great. This Weaver mobility was also quite good. The only thing I'm worried about is not having an external. That's it. But in every other respect, Resto Shaman feels great to me. I don't think they have throughput issues like people, like I've read some people say they do in the forums. But that is also, Resto Shaman is definitely the healer that is a bit more complex than it was in the past. If you really want to push out the good numbers and do good healing, and make it seem like strong, you need to be combining your abilities well. You need to be leveraging your flame shocks to buff your next heal. You need to be leveraging your um, healing, dropping healing stream totem to buff your next three riptides or healing waves, healing surges, things like that. You need to be buffing your chain heals when you need your AOE healing, things like that. But if you play around those, Resto Shaman is great. Up next is going to be Holy Priest. I found Holy Priest to have strong maintenance throughput and decent damage as well for very little GCD cost. And that is the strong, the maintenance healing and the damage. You can get quite a lot of value for both of those things by effectively pressing one button on cooldown. And that is because Prayer of Mending does some very heavy lifting right now. I spec for it. I pretty much always play prayer mending builds because I, I really just, I like the spell. I like hearing it bounce around. I like thinking that I'm setting up healing for future events and things like that. So that's just how I play Holy Priest. And for the damage components with very little GCD cost, that's gonna come down primarily to Holy Fire. Holy Fire is MVP for damage for Holy Priest. Now, the things I have noticed, the, the kind of weakness for Holy Priest is that its AoE throughput is quite dependent on being able to use uh, Sanctify so it has the kind of your group needs to be stacked positional requirement and obviously you need the cooldowns up. Holy Priest feels like it does quite well in in somewhat clean groups if you know that you can use your holy words for like kind of like unavoidable mechanic healing holy priest feels great if you end up using your holy words to kind of heal up other people's mistakes and then you don't have them to trade into mechanics holy priest feels rough i'm going to be trying out some uh, more mastery heavy builds some higher throughput or some more sustained throughput as I get into higher keys because I think Holy Priest will need it to deal with the if like the spread AoE kind of healing mechanics 
I've played around with a light weaver build, the prayer mending like heavy build with the, I believe it's miracle worker that gives serenity and sanctify two charges. And also with a divine word build with a few like combinations of those kind of three capstones. Light weaver sucks unfortunately. To me that is because it buffs the kind of like the rotational maintenance healing aspect of Holy Priest but does nothing to help its cooldown healing or its burst healing and that's where I feel like Holy Priest is at its weakest. It's also just a it's a straight up numerically weaker version of flash concentration. It feels like a more modern and like better more streamlined version of that but it is still numerically weaker. To trade away the other talents to get a talent that makes your just normal like stand still press a button heal one person or two people kind of rotational healing it just doesn't feel like a good trade-off at the moment holy priest spot healing or like um the sort of healing damage patterns that lightweaver excels at i believe that holy priest already does a pretty good job of that so specking into a capstone that makes what Holy Priest is already pretty good at, better at, is it's just not a good choice. Miracle Worker, on the other hand, makes Holy Priest's cooldowns stronger, and its cooldowns is where it needs help the most. So that feels fairly mandatory to me at the moment. Same with Divine Word. Being able to, every minute, you can either supercharge your AoE stack throughput or your damage if there's some kind of like uh, burst damage phase you need to contribute damage on, or being able to supercharge your spot healing. Divine Word is strong because it has the flexibility there and you can effectively take two of the three capstones. So for my play the last couple of weeks, I've just been ignoring Lightweaver. I tried it out, didn't like it. I think similar to Preservation, a Holy Priest will be quite dependent on your group's positioning. If your group stacks up well, then it could feel great. But if people are spread out all over the place, Holy Priest might have some issues. I also think not having a kick, I haven't noticed much of an issue around that at the moment, but again, I mean, it's Mythic Zeros. Most stuff dies before you really have to worry about kick rotations or any kind of dangerous casts going off. So at the moment, not having a kick doesn't feel bad. But as we get into higher keys, I'll be interested to see how my opinion on this changes. Next up is Discipline. Discipline for me, is probably the most fun out of all healing specs. For that reason alone, I, like, I don't think Discipline is particularly strong in Mythic Plus. I don't think it's bad by any stretch of the imagination either, but I don't think it's as good in some aspects as uh, Resto Druid or Preservation or even Holy Pally. But Discipline is the spec that I'll be playing the most, at least early on, and the spec I'll be logging into first thing tomorrow morning to get into Mythic Plus. So with that being said, the Dark Disc version of Discipline Priest, and that is to say the, the kind of right side spec tree that takes Expiation, Mindbender, uh, Tormenting Spirits or whatever it's called, that kind of the right hand focus tree is in my, I guess what I'm talking about when I say Dark Disc is that is what I'm talking about. I don't think it's a good build at the moment. The main reason for that is that Expiation, Eating, Purge the Wicked, Dot Uptime, is way too punishing. The trick or like the, the main focus of Dark Disc is to make Mind Blast a good atonement damaging button. And Expiation does that to a point, but it also, you pay such an enormous price for it by losing Purge the Wicked dot uptime. Now that being said, I, I had a whole video on this. Uh, if you're really interested in my thoughts on Dark Disc, it's on my channel, but the kind of long story short here is that I will be playing a, I guess you would say a not so dark disc like a gray disc i guess version and that is a version that still takes stolen psyche to buff mind blast atonement healing but doesn't take expiation at the moment as well i also don't think i'm taking harsh discipline but i will be taking aegis i think aegis is mandatory for discs at the moment the major problem with any disc build that doesn't take aegis of wrath to buff its power word shield is that if you don't have Aegis, your Rapture ceases to feel like a cooldown. So I'm, I've been playing a, a build that takes Aegis of Wrath, Lenience, Stolen Psyche, and Wheel and Woe. I'll be looking at taking Harsh Discipline as soon as I can. And the way I'm gonna try to tackle that is by basically only taking it once I have enough haste to make pressing Smite four times between Penance, not delay my next Penance. 
See, the way I see it is if you're pressing smite four times, if, if penance cooldown is nine seconds and you have to press smite four times between each penance to get your full harsh discipline and wheel and woe kind of buffing together effect, with low amounts of haste that becomes very difficult because any amount of like movement or having to dispel or also press your power word shield on cooldown and apply a dot and press mind blast and whatever else, there's too many globals to fit inside your window between penances. The more haste we have, the easier it's going to be to kind of get all of those buttons in that window. So I, I imagine that by the time I get to 15 or even 20% haste, then playing Harsh Discipline will feel good again. At the moment though, and for the past week or so, I haven't been playing with Harsh Discipline. We'll see how it goes. The major problem with the taking Expiation though, is that it removes Purge the Wicked, or at least six seconds of Purge the Wicked on any enemy you hit Mind Blast with, which means that fewer enemies die with Purge the Wicked on them, which then means you don't get the mana back from your class talent. And not getting the mana back on enemies dying with Purge the Wicked is basically saying goodbye to your entire mana bar over the course of the dungeon. My not so dark disc build still takes Shadow Covenant, I still take Schism, I still press Mind Blast, but I also have very strong uh, Power Word Shields and Penances, which feels great. The AoE throughput you can get from Discipline if you really need it, uh, in kind of burst situations like being able to press power word radiance into shadow covenant into radiance again feels really strong uh, the fact that you can then pump even more healing into your kind of aoe targets via your normal atonement healing also feels really quite good i had no trouble bursting 30 40 45k healing when things went wrong in mythic zeros i also found defensive penance was i mean it feels really good before the 40 40 changes Defensive Penance, especially with Harsh Discipline, was always a lot of overhealing. But now with the 40-40 changes, Defensive Penance just, it's excellent heavy spot healing when you really need it, which has been great. That along with a juiced up Power Word Shield means that uh, my spot healing on Discipline hasn't had any issues whatsoever, either has my tank healing. I'm already getting 100k Power Word Shield crits on you know DPS targets with 200k health. So I can I can shield someone fairly consistently for somewhere between 25 and 50% of their health, and that's that's preset bonus, which is going to buff that even more. The mana with the not so dark disc build is also like it's 100% fine. My mana bar, once I stopped playing around Expiation, my mana bar basically stopped moving. I could heal a whole dungeon last week or earlier this week and not drop below 90% on my Discipline Priest. Damage overall also feels quite good. It doesn't have the big AoE kind of burst healing for something like the like Algathar Academy pulls, but its normal kind of rotational damage is decent as Discipline. Getting 10k damage overalls on my Dis Priests, Resto Shaman and Resto Druid weren't an issue even at like 355, 360 item level. Next up is going to be Preservation. I don't have that much to say about Preservation. The entire healing toolkit feels so numerically overtuned <laughs> that, I mean, there just, there just isn't that much to say. You press pretty much any button and your team is permanently at full health. Dream Breath is, it does so much heavy lifting and it's so strong. Seeing a hot that you can apply to your entire team that lasts like 24 seconds or whatever, tick for 10k is just, it's obscene. The only thing I'm worried about for preservation is that I found in my Mythic Zeros playing with some groups, like range heavy groups that for whatever reason, you know, the guys that just always play 40 yards away from everybody else. In pugs, your group positioning could be quite frustrating if they sit at max range for no reason the whole dungeon. But groups that are either melee heavy or you know, play fairly close together, preservation feels like you're cheating. What other healers do throughput wise to move health bars with like three or four or five abilities, preservation does with one, which is kind of crazy. Like I said at the moment, Dream Breath is just, it does so much work that almost pressing any other button feels like a waste of time. I'm interested to see how that's going to change as we push into higher keys. At the moment, Dream Breath is numerically strong enough to handle 
everything. You echo a Dream Breath onto the tank and the health bar basically isn't going to move. You press Dream Breath for your AoE healing, your spot healing, your tank healing, whatever it is. The health bars basically aren't going to drop. So as we get into higher keys, I'll be very interested to see how many more buttons I have to press, how much more of the preservation toolkit I need to lean into to be effective. Apart from the kind of group positioning issue, the other somewhat minor issue I see that I might be running into playing preservation is that my tank healing isn't great. For most tanks, simply keeping reversion up on them or an echo dream breath is going to be enough, but playing with maybe brewmasters or tanks that require a lot more babysitting from the healer, preservation may struggle with this. And that is just because reversion isn't that strong. Uh, spamming living flame into a single target like a tank for healing is definitely not something you want to be doing. All of that being said, however, in a pre-patch, if I was playing with a tank that was getting absolutely destroyed in any key, Golden Hour did a huge amount of work on tank healing. If anything, Golden Hour got buffed because of the 40-40 changes and it's a kind of percent health heal. So I imagine as we get into higher and higher keys, Golden Hour, especially Echoed Gold, Golden Hour is going to be even more impactful than it was before. So when I say that preservation tank healing isn't great, I could be 100% wrong on that and that Golden Hour just does a lot of work. We'll see how that plays out. There's also the option that Temporal Anomaly can almost trivialize a lot of group healing if your group is melee heavy or, or stacks quite well. Preservation to me was the healer. The I think the first week of Mythic Pluses, I basically healed them all with just Dream Breath and doing damage. And then the next week, I decided to play around with some more Temporal Anomaly playstyles like I did in Beta and yeah, Dream Breath healing feels great until you play Temporal Anomaly and then it feels like you're cheating, like you've just broken the game. You just typed in IDDQD and yeah. Temporal Anomaly was doing 70 to 80% of my overall healing in a couple of Mythic Zeros. The ability to throw out for the sake of, I guess, uh, argument or like napkin math, the ability to throw out 175% spell power shields onto three targets three times every six seconds is insane. And it probably needs to get hurt. Uh, it has a somewhat large mana cost, but because none of the rest of Preservation's toolkit really costs mana, it feels a bit like if you don't press Temporal Anomaly, you probably like the you're not going to spend your mana anyway. Uh, overall, Preservation, to no one's surprise, feels very strong. It has great damage. It has excellent cooldowns. It has good mobility. It has great spot healing if you take into account Golden Hour. It has excellent AoE throughput. It has the ability to blanket a group or at least like parts of a group in absorb shields that no other healer has. And it has no mana issues whatsoever. So I expect my preservation keys next week and going forward are probably going to be the easiest of any healer. I guess I'll have to come back and, and see how right or, right or wrong I was in this prediction. Next up is Resto Druid. Now to me, Resto Druid is probably the healer with the most build variety right now in like your talent options. And I imagine that that's going to lead to many varied opinions on Resto Druids. I feel like there are some talent builds you can play right now that are good enough that you don't feel like you're doing anything wrong, but not good enough to make you think that Resto Druid is good. Now I spent uh, quite a few dungeons playing a kind of rejuvenation heavy, germination, regenesis, nurturing dormancy kind of build where I focus on my rejuvenations for most of my healing and that wasn't bad but it's far too mana intensive far too global intensive in my opinion to be a good build for mythic plus at least and like I said it wasn't enough I still felt like like I was playing properly it just didn't feel like Resto Druid was particularly strong because I was spending quite a lot of mana and all of my globals on maintaining all of my hots. And then a lot of my healing was kind of uh, delayed in that I could. it felt like I could really only move health bars once I had spent a few globals building up hots on that target to then heal them. I even played around with the uh, power of the Archdruid to try and make my 
rejuvenation spreading uh, more easy or consistent. But then I played a few dungeons with Life Bloom, playing around mostly Life Bloom. And yeah, Life Bloom is single handedly what makes Dragonflight Resto Druid so strong in Mythic Plus, in my opinion. Life Bloom and the bloom effect were quite often 40% of my overall healing in a dungeon. They, I mean, life bloom is very strong. It's mana efficient. It's global cooldown efficient, and it synergizes well with many other talents like verdancy or harmonious blooming. It's it's all of Resto Druid's strength in effectively one ability. Your wild growths, your rejuve, your regrowth, none of those abilities by themselves are overwhelmingly strong. But in true kind of Resto Druid fashion, if you have something that is very strong like Life Bloom, that is also so efficient that you can then spend all of your mana on your wild growths and you can spend all of your globals on regrowths and things like that, the whole toolkit comes together to be very, very strong. Combine all that with uh, the regrowth talents like Flash of Clarity and Rampant Growth that allows you to spread your regrowth pots to your life bloom targets. And I was also toying around with a Power of the Arch Druid build that focuses on regrowth with the regrowth and kind of life bloom talents, which has honestly also felt quite good. There were quite a lot of times where I could press regrowth once and get the regrowth hot onto five targets, which felt, that was just really fun. Being able to regrowth or get the regrowth hot applied to the whole party with a single cast. Yeah, that's pretty good. Uh, Verdancy or stacked healing is also incredibly strong, but it is random. I also very much enjoyed the ability to deal damage as a resto druid without having to cat weave. Cat weaving is one of those things that I just never liked as a healer. And one of the things that made me stay away from Resto Druid throughout pretty much all of Shadowlands. But now being able to take Starfire and Star Search and play as a caster build, especially with like Circle of Life and Death, that means that you effectively spend many more of your globals just on refreshing your dots. And those dots, along with the occasional Starfire or Star Surge is enough to contribute quite a lot of damage as a caster at range. That felt awesome. The one weakness I have for Resto Druid right now is that the class tree still feels bad. I'm a little bit disappointed that Blizzard never got around to removing the last three point talents in the entire game on the Druid class tree, so having them still there kind of sucks. But the main gripe I have with the class tree is that at, like, at the moment for Mythic Zeros, I haven't worried about taking Kick or like some of my utility like Typhoon or Ursol's Vortex, I've been able to just focus on like the automatic frenzied regen and getting my wild growth buff and my rejuve buff and my 6% haste buff and things like that from the class tree. I could, I could basically be very greedy and just take pure kind of throughput quality of life nodes or defensive nodes. But I imagine as I get into Mythic Plus, I will have to give some of that up to take Kick and to take things like Ursols or Typhoon. So I'm not looking forward to that, but we'll see how that goes. And uh, last but not least is Holy Paladin. Now, Holy Paladin is the healer that I leveled the last or the, the, the latest. Uh, and it is the healer at 70 that I have the least experience on at the moment. So I don't have a whole lot to kind of say or complain about for them at the moment. The things I did notice mostly from doing uh, normals and heroics at 70, I didn't get a chance to step into mythic zeros on my paladin. I will make sure I spend a bit of time this coming week getting some more experience on them in mythic plus. But for now, the main issue I have with holy paladin is its mobility. It feels by far the worst of any healer. It feels even worse than uh, the other. The, the two priest specs are also quite limited mobility, but Holy Paladin feels even worse than them. Damage in pugs especially is also quite difficult at the moment because a lot of it is reliant on your Shield of the Righteous. And for Holy Paladin especially, the bigger you pull, the more damage they deal. So in pugs or in kind of normal dungeons, their damage feels a little lacking. I don't like spending all of my Holy Power on Shield of the Righteous 
because I don't know if the random pug guys are gonna like stand in the bad or they're gonna pull way bigger than I think they are or you know, I, I'm not quite sure what's gonna happen so I always like having some holy power in my back pocket in case I need it which limits my damage quite a bit. I will say that uh, my beacon felt like really strong at 70 much more than it did in previous expansions like in Shadowlands especially with tanks that weren't fantastic. My beacon was was quite often the second most healing done in a dungeon for me and being able to kind of focus on healing the party and not having to worry about the tank again like how beacon should be has felt felt pretty good. A one minute sacrifice is also just crazy strong right now feels great and I have been playing a caster build not a melee build for Holy Paladin. Now I'd like to quickly explain that when I, at least when I talk about the caster build, all I'm talking about is the way in which I generate the holy power. The melee build uses Crusader Strike and the caster build uses, I think it's called Tower of Radiance to get holy power from Flash Heal or Holy Light cast into beacon targets. I still play the caster build in melee range. I'm still there for Consecration. I'm still there for Kick, Hodge, Blind, things like that. And the caster build, in that sense for me has felt very very good the ability to bank or quickly build up a lot of holy power has been excellent it's probably the, the most enjoyable change going from shadowlands into dragonflight for me has been holy paladin's ability to build holy power much more quickly if i need to holy paladin also has absolutely no mana issues whatsoever like if i go below 95 percent or 90 percent mana Something has gone terribly wrong. And I also, like, I, I thought that I would have throughput issues on Holy Paladin, but even with absolutely no gear, doing 30k HPS or something in like a 320 item level Paladin hasn't been a problem at all. Wings as a cooldown and also being able to go into Holy Avenger is just, yeah. The, the cooldown throughput options for Paladin feel like they're there. 40 yard range on Lod also feels excellent and I guess we'll see how it goes as we get into Mythic Plus next week. So thanks everyone for watching, thanks for a thousand subscribers to those of you who have subscribed. And I'm I'm really enjoying Dragonflight, best expansion for me since probably Mop. And I'm really looking forward to getting into Mythic Plus and seeing how all of my kind of views and opinions here change over time as I get more experience in Mythic Plus, as I climb to higher ratings, as I play with better groups and things like that. So yeah, thanks everyone for watching and algorithm stuff.